Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Terra CRG, Meridian Capital Group, Wickhoff Organization. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Eastern Union Funding, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hersha Hospitality, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Wharton, not Wharton, University of Pennsylvania. A teacher. Mm, I'm going to go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm going to be involved with public relations for a cork company. Nah. These are guys are really good. These young guys, they are talented. I'll become their manager. North Carolina? Nah, you know, I want to get to the Big Apple. I want to get to the Big Apple. I want to be on television. I want to be involved. You know what? I'm going to get involved with TV. I'm going to get involved with movies. I'm going to get involved with being the producer of Morty, Morton Downey Show. I'm going to be involved with the Friars Club. And I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write more than a book. I'm going to write a book on what makes people think. What's the real key to success? And I really have the man who's been successful, the four-time Emmy Award winner, Bill Boggs. Thank you. You sound like me after a couple drinks thinking about my life. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me. So tell me about how the German mother right. entered Philadelphia and the Scottish man went to Philadelphia. How they, where'd they arrive from? Well, you know, my mother's parents were both immigrants who met at a German-American club. I'm half half German, half Irish, which makes me say, I'm, you know, I'm all crazy and half smart. Right. Um, they uh, had five children. My mother was by far the youngest of the five. A um, lot of longevity in the family. That immigrant mother, my mother's lived to be 101. Her brother lived to be 101. My mother lived, God bless her, lived to be 96. And on my father's side of the family, the Boggs, I don't even know, you know, I like to find out how long they actually were in Philadelphia before my father was born, and my mother met my father at a uh, carnival. <laughs> Somebody was wrestling an alligator. You That's right. Uh, as, as the tale goes, they were at a neighborhood carnival that included one of these crazy attractions of a guy wrestling an alligator. And my mother was saying, oh, this is too, the girl, her girlfriend, this is really phony. And my father happened to be sitting right behind them. My mother's very attractive. My father's just big, handsome guy. So my father leans over and says, no, I know this guy. There actually is some danger involved. So my mother got picked up by my father at a carnival watching a guy wrestle an alligator. Your father, you said to me, was, I think, above the age to get into the military, correct? Well, um, yeah, during World War II, my father had, you know, a couple of children, well, my sister and I, and also being married had, and, and being like age 46 or 47 had a very low deferment number. Right. So. He was the air raid warden. 
We still have his air raid warden helmet. So he was the air raid warden. So is this picture, we have this Bendix radio when you were five. Yes, right. You, you know, you were listening, as you said to me, to the golden age of, of radio. You, you used to... Well, I, I consider myself blessed that I'm old enough to have caught the golden age of radio. And what happened was, as a very little kid, four or five years old, I had this tiny radio that I listened to. And I loved, particularly loved Art Linkletter, and people are funny, and Arthur Godfrey, you know, and, and his show. And I just thought, gee, when I grow up, that would be a fun thing to do. So it wasn't like I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. It was a beeline. But I always was interested in show business my entire life, since I got that radio. You said to me when you were going to school, you were very, I mean, you went to a large school where you were the president of the class during high school. Well, Abraham Lincoln High School, Northeast Philadelphia, 4,400 students, 100-acre campus, Tremendous public education. And <clears throat> I, I was the treasurer, vice president, president of Student Association. But you were also helping your dad, who was selling the vacuums, right? Well, my father put me in business. Of, you know, I like to say, if you're from a working class family in, in Philadelphia, you know how to hustle to make a living. I don't mean shake people down. But I think that I, my first job was on my bicycle when I was in around seventh grade selling vacuum cleaner belts and bags door to door. And I made $100 that summer selling, literally, little kid ringing a bell selling stuff door to door because my father showed me how to put them on the vacuum cleaner. So I would go in, well, yeah, I can do that. Get your cleaner out. Here's a new belt. Here's a new bag. Give me the money. And I'd park my bike at the end of the block, do one side, do the other side of the street, get on my bike, ride to another block. So you graduate high school. Yeah. Uh, at that time, you, you joined the, uh, before you went to college, you went into the uh, Army Reserve, correct? No. No, I went into the Army Reserve between the <clears throat> University of Pennsylvania, oh, okay. we'll undergraduate the, and, and uh, graduate school. Let's, let's go back. Yeah. So you're, you're in Philadelphia, and you enter the University of Pennsylvania. Correct. For literature, correct? English and sociology. Whatever the easiest courses were that I could get through. That was my goal. Somehow, I got a scholarship to Penn. And I just thought, wow, this is great. I want to get through and I want to get to graduate school in communications and get my master's and get some training that would help me. In, in so you went to the Annenberg School of... Uh... Annen Annenberg School of Communication. Got a master's degree there. That was great. Great year. And then you went, to, then you went into the military for six months? No. Between Penn and Annenberg, I had this gap because I graduated from, from high school in January, in January so. and graduated from Penn in December. So I had a, that period of time, did not want to go to Vietnam, did not want to be drafted, did not want to be... So when were you the substitute teacher? Once I got my degree from Penn to make money, hustling, uh, I became a substitute teacher. So I, I substitute teach, taught whew, all the way through graduate school during the time I was with the comedy team. Anytime I needed a buck, I just said I'm available. So let's talk about this. You graduate, and how do you get to Armstrong Tile uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Well, when I got out of Annenberg, my goal was basically to try to find a job in television, in show business. But I think of the larger picture of show business. I went to a film production company. I was knocking on Channel, 5, Channel 6, Channel 3, Channel 10, trying to get my foot in the door, and the phone rang. As Gloria Vanderbilt said, your whole life can change with a, with a phone call. And the phone rang, and it was Armstrong, core company now, Armstrong World Products. They recruited me. And they said, we have a very creative job for you. It involves shooting films. It involves writing speeches. In, in, in the Amish country. Yeah, this is a yeah. Fortune 500 company out there in, in Amish country. And I rationalized, wow, this is like show business. I, I can get a car. I won't be living with my parents. I can't believe I'll make this much money. Sure. And after about three months or less, really, I realized I'd made a phenomenal mistake by settling to take that job rather than continue to try to get but intelligence. But everything is meant to be. That's correct. Okay, so what happens is you meet these two guys. No, well, one guy, Jay Tarsus, I actually encouraged to come to Armstrong because he was working for Alan Funt, had his daughter, Jamie Tarsus, who would go on to be president of ABC Broadcasting. She was two, two years old. A son on the way. I said, come down here. They've got creative jobs. It's boring, but you're going to make some money and regroup. So Tarsus comes down, ends up sitting next to a guy named Tom Patchett. 
They start writing comedy routines out of boredom. One day, walking down the hall, they're doing a routine. I, what is it? We're writing these comedy routines. And in those days, there were great sketch comedians. You had Stiller and Mirror, Roland Martin, Mike Nichols, Elaine May. I said, do another routine. In the middle of this routine, I had a blinding revelation. This is hand to God true. They're great. I love comedy, right? We'll go into show business. I'll be their agent. And six months later, they were on the Merv Griffin Show, making their national television debut. They went, went on to be hugely successful. You could have been an agent. Forget TV. I was a manager. I know. I that's what I'm saying. You, you were an agent. No, okay. I, I actually ended up being their manager. The, uh, the agent was a guy uh, named Irvin Arthur. Uh, so, so you become their manager. You get them booked over the, a lot of bookings, and yeah. they do rather well. Really well. And then Bernie Brill's thing is a well. What happened was, we were doing extremely well. The, the comedy team was called Patch and Tarsus, and we were set to move to the West Coast, and they were creating a new morning show in Philadelphia, and Debbie Miller, who, who was working for the Mike Douglas show, hadn't been trained by Roger Ailes, who was produce, executive producer of Mike Douglas at that time, came to me and said, "Look." I think you have it within you to be a great TV producer. Really? He said, yeah. I'd like you to be my associate producer on this new morning show we're replacing Tom Snyder. I said, Debbie, geez, that's really flattering, but I'm set to move to the West Coast with Patrick and Tarsus. Make a long story short, the question that changed my life was, what would it take for you to stay? And I said, you told me the show's going to have a host and five people, and one of those people will be on TV one day a week. You let me be your associate producer and one of those people. No auditioning. I know I can do it. I'll find another manager for Patrick and Tarsus, and I'll stay here. And so I ended up uh, contacting Bernie Brillstein. Bernie Brillstein uh, ended up with Brillstein Gray. They went on to the West Coast, stopped performing, and became the head uh, writers for Bob Newhart. Made so a lot now of money. you're over there. You're the producer, one of the producers, and you're also... The on once a week. Once a week. Mr. Weekend. That so, was my so, first so, job on television. So you have Mr. Weekend. So mm -hmm. what happens next? How does Mr. Weekend end up in North Carolina? Well, Mr. Weekend was, on, first off, my job was Mr. Weekend in Philadelphia in the, in, in the early 70s, telling people what to do on the weekend, which was primarily get out of town in those days in Philadelphia, go to New York, not now. But what, what happened was... Um, it wasn't enough. I mean, it was like playing for the Phillies, batting once a week. So I made a New Year's resolution, which I'm big at, making resolutions and sticking to it, um, that I would go anywhere in America to get my own show. And I really just started telling everybody. A friend of mine said, wake up in the morning as if you already have your show. Told everybody. And one thing led to another. Within three weeks, I got a call to audition, went to High Point, North Carolina, replaced Farm, Home, and Garden, produced my own show called Southern Exposure with Bill Boggs and beat the Today Show three years. So what was Southern Exposure with Bill Boggs? A one hour, live, morning, nine in the morning talk show that was produced by me. So sometimes we'd have, maybe Dan Rather was on, I'd have him for the whole show. Sometimes we'd have cooking segments and it would be like a magazine show. Whatever I thought would work. We'd had live music. I'd go over to the Greensboro Coliseum and interview Sonny and Cher. I have film of Sonny and Cher with little chastity on their lap, the Jackson 5, any act that came to town. The show ended up getting syndicated thanks to Phil Lombardo throughout the South and did extremely well. So you're there three years, right? Something three amazingly happy creative years. So yeah. what happens? You, you have the bug to get back to Philly or to the big No, well, what, what happened was the show made noise. I mean... You had this guy doing Southern Exposure that was beating the Today Show from, from the first show and syndicated a couple other stations. So I was sought out by Miami, San Francisco, and New York, Channel 5, WNEW in those days. And uh, I decided to come to New York, and that was how I got here. Yeah. So you come to New York, and right. what do you get then? Is hmm? it midday at that time? or is it? Yeah, it was Midday Live, which I added with Bill Boggs to, to it. And... Uh, so that's, that's how I got to New York. But the first thing was interesting when I came to New York, Michael, was uh, you know, really immersing myself in New York culture. Now, in, in North Carolina, I lived out in Thomasville. I had a house, a swimming pool, 250 acres behind me, was doing the show that I had complete control over, had seven weeks a year off because I taped one extra show a week. And people said to me, 
how could you stand living in North Carolina? That's when I saw a certain provincialism that only a Philadelphian can spot in New Yorkers. So you come to New York. Yeah. You're on midday, and then after midday, you had another show. Well, during the midday years, which is 13 years, I hosted a game show for CBS. I hosted a cable show uh, for CBS, a late night thing called Upstairs at Xenon. Richard Baker and I produced shows for MTV. I host and co-executive produce Comedy Tonight for two years, 120 stations, and other stuff. We had a couple of specials for NBC. So the 13-year period of midday, and I did weekend, I did, um, what was the Saturday morning live? I was really busy. I really worked hard, really hard. At one point, I was on camera nine seven-day weeks, 63 straight days. Now, then uh, Mr. Rupert Murdoch decides to buy Metro Media. No, <clears throat> yes, that's uh, correct. And, and it became Fox. It became Fox. That's right. And then you, then you returned back home for a little while. Well, what happened was, um, then, so they canceled Midday, which I was very happy. Honestly, Michael, I, I was really happy to see what else life had to offer after 13 years. And I went to the West Coast. I worked with Dick Clark trying to develop something that didn't happen. And after about nine months, my, my son Trevor is out in the West Coast with his mother, Linda. I realized I got to get back to work, had to make some money. So I went back on the air in the interviewer's chair in Philadelphia with a show called Time Out. Right. So from Time Out, how do you get, because you were one of the people involved with the first shows on the Food Network. Well, there's a big jump between Time Out in Philadelphia to the Food Network. And what happened was... I got sick. I, I had been interviewing people considering North Carolina and New York for 18 straight years. And there was this day, I'll never forget it, I'm interviewing the, the Chippendales for the 18th time in my career. And the, with this shaved, greasy chest. And I'm asking the same stupid questions. And the women in the audience are screaming the same stupid stuff. And I thought, you know, it's time to do something different. So once again, I made a resolution that I would just want to change my life, and I became executive producer of the Morton Downey right, Jr. So, so that was the so, long way from, from Food Network. So the Morton Downey Jr. show was did exceptionally well, but Morton Downey was his own worst enemy. Yes, he, he was extremely self-destructive. And then after the Morton Downey Jr. show, what, what came next? Well, then I worked at a job which I was not well-suited, but I was in, under the umbrella of Bob Pittman's company, right? And so they were launching something called Court TV with Steve Brill, a genius guy from American Lawyer. And so I was the executive producer who helped form what became Court TV that ultimately was purchased and then became true, true. television. But it was not a good fit for me, as, as I did not have a natural inclination and interest in the judicial system, except staying out of jail. Okay, so when, when, main when, you, when did you write the novel? The novel, At First Sight, was written in 1980 in the middle of years. Um, it was Grosset and Dunlap. And Renee Zellweger actually optioned it a few years ago so, together with my... So what shows were you doing at Court, at Court TV over there? I did no shows. I was executive producer helping launch it. And after that ended amicably with Steve Brill, I decided I wanted to get back on television. And I had a fallow period of really not making enough money. Fortunately, I had savings. I did all night radio on WOR, and uh, I was interested in food, always interested in the concept of interviewing people and eating at the same time, which we did um, on midday. We had, we'd have these round tables. And so I, I started to, oh, my agent got me an audition for NBC, WNBC. And so for uh, two years, I was anchor of Weekend Today in New York. And that was only working, you know, Saturday and Sunday. So the rest of the time, I was just trying to hustle around and make some more money. And when I heard that the Food Network was being created, I went to them and said, look, you need me. I have been doing a radio show on food, which I was doing on the side, and so we show. And so when did you decide, because I know that the one-man show, which you still do today, what? Talk Show Confidential? Yes. I have to say I'll be doing that play at Guildhall August 25th, Talk Show Confidential. Um, <clears throat> Guildhall in East Hampton. Let's see. I was working for the Food Network. The Food Network had three different shows. And Robin Leach was hosting something called Food Network Live, which was all very labor intensive. And he didn't want to do it anymore. So I took over that. So I was working on the weekends going around the country. And one of the chefs we were working with was Jacques Pepin. 
And Jacques Pepin, in his beautiful, handsome man, his accent says, Bill, you should go on crystal cruises. They would love you as a speaker. You're such a good storyteller. You must meet them. So I was on the West Coast, and I'm driving over to meet Crystal Cruises, thinking, you know, what can I talk about? All right, I'll make up something. Talk show confidential. Confessions of a talk show host. I've got these funny, true stories. So I went on one cruise, and I've been doing it ever since, one or two cruises a year. I've now got six talks. And I came back, Michael, and the talk I gave, Confessions of a Talk Show Host, went over so well, I said to myself, I have it in me to do more on stage. And so I, I created a full-blown off-Broadway show, which uh, was underwritten uh, on a theater on 42nd Street. And then uh, Peter Martin at the Triad Theater loved it. And he picked it up and said, Bill, you can do it here as long as you want. So for six years, once a week and then once a month, with various changes, I did Talk Show Confidential, Confessions of a Talk Show Host at the Triad Theater, while doing lots of other things. I've always loved stage work, stage performing. I've been in a couple of musicals, I've been in plays, and I've always loved that feeling of a live audience. And it's still, to this day, my favorite thing to do. Now, when you wrote this book, which was 2007, but you started yes. before, yes. how did you decide to write the book about key to success for people? When I interviewed Frank Sinatra back in 1975, I got to know Sinatra, and he occasionally would watch the show. When he was at the Waldorf, he says to me, your show, it's like, it's like the Today Show for me. I wake up maybe if I'm lucky, right. one o'clock in the afternoon, you're on. So um, we had had um, Itzhak Rabin, the, the former prime minister of Israel, who sadly was assassinated, on midday. And four days later, I was at a party over on the east side with Jilly, Frank, a few other people. And Frank wanted to know all about Itzhak Rabin. He had seen the show. And not the politics stuff. Sinatra wanted to cut to the chase. You know, why in Israel, this country with tough women and tough men, why did that guy rise to the top? And I, I got no answer. I'm fumfering around. And Sinatra says, listen, Billy, if you're going to be interviewing people, doing this all your life, paraphrasing, you have a unique opportunity to study these people. Take notes. Told me about how he used to study Dorsey, the breathing technique, Buddy Rich, stuff like that, rhythms. So Sinatra got me interested in going beyond doing the interview, as you're doing now, and really studying the lives of people. So I had whom I was interviewing. So, Michael, I had this idea for a book called Success Secrets of Successful People. I had it for many years. I was at a party at the Four Seasons Restaurant, The Value of Showing Up, met the president of Collins Books, who happened to be a fan of mine, meaning that he was very interested in my career. He and his kids used to watch me on Saturday morning live, blah, blah, blah. I told him I had an idea. One thing led to another, Michael, and I wrote, got what it takes, successful people so how, feel how they made it to the top. So how do you get to these 42 successful people? Oh, that's the easy part. When you've been, I, I started out as a talent coordinator, Produced my own show, Comedy Tonight. We booked 453 comedians. I know how to book people. So you, if, I'm, if, I, if I were hosting a talk show now, that's what I do. I so, book people. So you booked the 42 people for the book. Sure. So part of what you've also been doing the last couple of years is you've been with Vistage, right? The, I've been, uh, since well, I wrote the book, which is about success and, and, and uh, self-empowerment, right? Since I wrote the book, there was a demand for me to speak. People want to, oh, we'll talk about the book, motivate us, give a keynote. And so I fell in with Vistage, which is a CEO organization. I've given about 150 talks around the country based on the book about how to get the best out of yourself one day at a time. And uh, I always had the dream that in maybe like what you call the third act of your life, that I could use this intellectual property of interview, having interviewed thousands of amazingly successful people to help other people. So that's a little bit of what I'm doing now, too. We have a picture of you at Jazz at Lincoln Center. You've been involved. I do a lot of MC work. That's me with the great Monty Alexander, the two nights of remembering Jillies. He says to me, you're one of the few people around who actually remembers Jillies. I never think of myself like that, but I guess I am, you know. So uh, of the people that you've interviewed in your career, who, who, uh, who, who, who was the most interesting? Was it Frank? Other than Sinatra, 
All right, this, we don't have a picture of this, but you can find one of him. Of him. The more, Philippe Petit walked between the World Trade Centers. There was two movies done on it, Man on Wire, this is the documentary, one the, and the other one, The Wire. I interviewed him the morning after the walk. That was unbelievable. It was to, to hear this man say, I was attached to that wire. It didn't make any difference if I was 10 feet off the ground or 1,000 feet off the ground, I knew I was not going to fall. To have him tell the story of the bow and arrow shooting the rope across for the first time is something that sent chills down my spine, particularly because I have a fear of heights. <laughs> Horrible fear of heights. But now, you know, as I fail to say that we're both fellow friars, you're active in the Friars Club also. Well, the Friars Club, you know, anybody in show business in New York area should want to be in the Friars Club. And I'm fortunate to be an officer together with um, Jerry Lewis uh, and uh, Larry King, a couple other people who are officers of the club. Friars Club means a lot. It's, you know, people just think of it as a place that has these big roasts, but probably on a week-in, week-out basis, they have more intellectual and entertainment activities than any other club in New York. I mean, all manner of stuff, plus so, great food. So let's talk about two, two other important things in your life. One is Trevor, and the other thing is Jane. Right, well, take them in that order. My son, Trevor Boggs, uh, born on Shakespeare's birthday, and he, a unique ability verbally, uh, set his sights on being a successful writer. Um, only thing I can brag about him is that uh, they had to take an ERB test to get into the little Episcopal school when they were, I don't know, four years old. The teacher calls me, I was at Court TV, she said, I've, I've got to tell you about your son's score. I said, what? Uh-oh. She said, he scored beyond measurement in verbal acuity. We've never had a child in the history of school score this well verbally at age four. That's Trevor. And that's my talk son. about Lady Jane. Well, what can I say? <clears throat> well, I want to say to anybody watching right now, one of the great keys to life is finding a person with whom you are tremendously, happily, compatible. My mother told me a long time ago, and she was right, and it took me a long time to learn this, a relationship should not be a lot of work. And so Jane and I met in a mystical thing three days after my mother was buried, in that mystical way that people think dead people make things happen. Right. I often think my mother sent her to me. I like to think that. It makes me feel good. Uh, Jane Rothschild, um, native of New York, real estate, something you're a tiny bit familiar with, uh, just a heart of gold, smart, clever, funny, related to Sammy Kahn. She's hip, um, knows music, um, just uh, brings out the best of me. So, That's it. You know, fortunately, the radio, because the radio produced everything, and I'm happy that I had you as my guest today. Thank you for well, being here. Well, thank you. my God, this was fun. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much. When I get